The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Pine turtle Islam. That'd be cool. Herpetologists in California are on the trail of an increasingly elusive prey. It's not that frogs, salamanders, and other amphibians are getting better at hiding. It's that with each passing year, there are fewer of them to find. We found red-legged frogs here in the past. We usually have pretty good luck. Oh, cool. Let's see. Vance Friedenberg is an associate professor at San Francisco State. Recently, he and his team have been studying mountain yellow-legged frogs in the Sierra Nevada. What they're finding is alarming. A deadly disease is wiping out entire populations of frogs. So to be in the field and find hundreds and sometimes thousands of dead frogs piled all over the place, no one's ever heard of this in, you know, 100-plus years of herpetology. Suddenly it's happening now in our lifetimes. What is it about that? Right now, it's unknown if the devastating disease that's killing the yellow-legged frogs in the Sierra is affecting their Bay Area cousins. Oh, okay. Today, Vance has joined biologist Karen Swaim to test native red-legged frogs in one of Karen's study areas near Pacifica, California. Have you seen no, I... One of the most sort of well-known species of amphibians here in California are, these, are the California red-legged frog. This frog is a very charismatic frog. They get really big, they're really cool. They call at night, you can hear them calling. You used to be able to find them all over the place. These frogs were pretty much anywhere in California, any body of water you came up to, they would be around. Depleted by development and other threats, the native red-legged frog is facing a very uncertain future and is now a federally protected species. When I was a kid, I could go and find red-legged frogs with ease. I could go into Golden Gate Park and find things with ease. All of a sudden, they're gone. Frog decline isn't just happening in California. Amphibians have been disappearing all over the world. Of the over 6,000 species known to science, more than one-third are experiencing massive decline. It's a biological mystery. It's really alarming. Something like 40% of all known amphibians are threatened with some level of extinction. That's unprecedented in terms of vertebrate groups of animals. So scientists have been, you know, just banging their heads trying to figure out what's going on. Awesome, I got him. It's a oh, tiny little tree frog. Look at that. Excellent. Awesome, he's beautiful. And these and tree frogs are really cool because they have little discs right on the tips of their toes. You can really see them. Luckily, tree frogs like this little Pacific chorus frog seem to be doing okay. For Vance and Karen, the challenge is still to find and test a threatened red-legged frog. So he's not very old. Not an adult. This is not just a story about frogs. It's a story about our shared world and some very specific hidden threats. Well, so what? Who cares about frogs? I mean. Lots of people love them. I do. Most kids do. Um, well, it is the frogs, but it's not so much the frogs. It's the environment. I think that a lot of people tend to forget that we live here, too. Something is happening to the fundamental makeup of the globe, and I'm talking about water, and I'm talking about soil. If it is indeed a human-generated problem, this whole environmental health thing, we're committing suicide. And our first warning, or one of our earliest warnings, is the frog population. Frogs' unique physiology and their ties to both the water and the land can tell us a lot about what's going on in an entire ecosystem. Frogs are an ideal indicator of environmental health because they spend uh, part of their life, their whole developmental part of their life, in the water, most of them as eggs or as gilled larvae. But then they undergo metamorphosis to air-breathing adults, and because their skin is semi-permeable to the passage of water, any problems with the ground they're in or the water when they return to reproduce will affect them as adults. Even though a frog does have lungs, 
it can stay underwater and totally um, be fine. They can breathe right through their skin. And that's part of the reason that we believe that amphibians in general are seen as sort of this sort of sentinel group of species because they're very sensitive to any uh, changes in their environment. Frogs are being hit from all sides, and there are multiple factors that may be contributing to this die-off. Worldwide, amphibians are facing pollution, disease, habitat loss, climate change, competition and predation from invasive species, even the UV radiation effects from our depleted ozone layer. The perfect storm of bad stuff, the, the idea of a death by a thousand cuts. You know, at some point, these species, these populations, these individuals, they just can't handle it anymore. I mean, think of, think of the populations here in California. They've got uh, to deal with um, encroaching growth. They've got to deal with the climate change issues. And then they've got the Central Valley is right next to the Sierra Nevada. And Central Valley is one of the most pesticide-ridden areas in the world. It's not surprising to me that that probably has a big effect on these, on these populations of frogs. One approach scientists are taking is focusing on very specific threats. At UC Berkeley, Professor Tyrone Hayes is leading a study on the effects of pesticide pollution in the water system. Recently, he's seen entire populations of frogs wiped out. Up till now, the pesticide that we've studied the most is atrazine. It's an herbicide or weed killer, and it is number one or number two used pesticide in the world. We use 80 million pounds per year. That's a lot. A half million pounds come down into rainwater every year. That's a lot of atrazine. And atrazine is involved in a number of things, including uh, disrupting hormone balance in frogs, sex hormones. So we get males that are chemically castrated. They actually have very low testosterone levels, almost no fertility. And in some cases, we get males that become hermaphrodites. They produce ovaries in addition to testes. Hay's work has revealed a direct line from human practices to amphibian mortality. But other causes are harder to pin down. As frogs are weakened by polluted water or habitat loss, they may be more susceptible to infection. Frogs all over the world are now being attacked by a disease called the chytrid fungus, and it's taking a devastating toll. It's a fungus that's been around probably for thousands of years. Uh, lately, a whole line of research suggests that environmental changes have reduced frogs' resistance to, to infection by this fungus. Vance and Karen are now looking to see if this pervasive disease is taking hold of the red-legged frogs in the Bay Area. The uh, disease is called chytridiomycosis, which is a mouthful. <laughs> it's caused by an um, aquatic fungus. This disease was not known to science um, as recently as about 1998. It's a really um, curious disease. It actually swims through the water, searching out a host. And then once it finds a host, it embeds itself in the skin of the host, and then the infection spreads throughout the skin of the animal. It turns out that we have found areas in California where we know there's a wave of this disease moving through populations of amphibians. A big question right now is trying to understand, number one, where is the disease? And number two, how is it spreading? And number three, what are the consequences of that? So it turns out for the frogs here in California, it's having dramatic effects. Awesome, what have you got there? I got a red like a frog. Oh, nice, look here. at that. Oh, he's yeah. beautiful. Right. Yeah, so we got a few things here. We got our, our gloves and our samples. Whoop. Yeah, well, that, it's actually, really, you know, it's really cool that we're testing these guys because this isn't the type of disease that you can just look at a frog and know if it's mm -hmm. infected. You, the only way you can tell is to, without hurting him, is to take it back swab the animal, take it back, take the uh, swab back to the lab and run it. And it can go pretty fast. It works really well if I sort of pin his feet down with my, um, with my finger here. So I'm not holding him very tight at all. Um, and if he knows he doesn't have any purchase, he, he sort of stops struggling and then we can just swab just like this. And this isn't hurting this frog at all, tickling him maybe, but... And then I just break it off, put it in there, and we're done. And do you test these in your lab? 
Yeah, then we take these back to the, to the lab and we extract the DNA, basically. Right now, nothing's known about the distribution of this fungus and it's killing populations of amphibians all over the place. So um, we'd really like to know, is mm -hmm. it here now? There's definitely hope if uh, people can wake up. Um, I think that it's a species we can save. While the current picture seems pretty bleak, fortunately, science is a journey of discovery. Now, as biologists begin to understand the problems, they're taking the first steps toward finding the solutions. I've been giving the, the doomsday story. I mean, it, it is a really bad, um, a really sad story what's been going on with the world's amphibians, but it's not all bad news. Uh, there are some cases where it looks like some of these populations of frogs that have been infected with, with this um, killer fungus are actually making it through these big population crashes. The good news and the sort of take home from my perspective is that by looking at the dynamics of the um, disease as it comes into these populations and by learning the basic ecology of, of um, how diseases work in wildlife, we think that we can change the outcome from an extinction to a survival. All right. Okay, little guys. Hey, guys. There you go. <laughs> Just gonna hang out. Juan's over there. Yeah. Well, not soon. Yeah. All right, let's go. Quest free. Discover more and donate at kqed.org slash quest.